Welcome to the Defenders Conference 2019. We are uh, obviously recording before uh, a number, uh, a, a live audience here, and uh, it is my distinct pleasure to have uh, the scholars uh, that have presented their views on gospel differences. And I will uh, go uh, from my right to left here. Uh, Rob Bowman, Bart Ehrman, Mike Lacona, and Craig Keener, and they've all had the chance to, to lay out their case. And uh, uh, some issues have sort of come forward, and, and we see the differences. Some people might be wondering, hey, uh, there might not be as many, or where exactly do they disagree? Uh, and especially for, I think Mike, Mike's was like, hey, where do I disagree with Craig? Well, I already know of a few places where they disagree, so uh, I'm ahead of him on that one. Uh, but we'll certainly bring that out uh, as we uh, have our discussion today. Uh, so um, our panel discussion is uh, geared towards really helping folks see these differences and to have uh, these scholars um, put on their boxing gloves. Uh, as they engage with one another and have some cross-examination going back and forth. Um, and uh, later on, we're going to have a special segment uh, instead of rapid questions. Uh, we have some dry erase boards down here, which we're going to use uh, to help uh, folks see the differences between folks. Uh, but I wanted to first kick off um, with uh, a question and engagement um, about the infancy narratives. This is something that was brought up many times. And there are different views uh, on this. Uh, so if we could each go sort of in a line here uh, and briefly, if we can, just you know, a minute or two, talk about your view of the infancy narratives and whether that, that what we read about in Matthew uh, or in Mark can be harmonized. Uh, if it can't be harmonized, uh, do we still accept them somehow? Uh, do we reject them? Uh, What's exactly, or, or maybe we don't know exactly what's going on there. If you could just describe your position, I think that would be helpful. Uh, I think what we have, I think what we have in, uh, is this working? Sorry. I think what we have in Matthew and Mark are perfectly uh, reconcilable because Mark doesn't talk about it. Um, Did I say Mark? I meant Luke. <laughs> Luke. Sorry. Che cheap shot. Um, I won't be back next year now. Uh, I... I take the position that the infancy narratives in Matthew and Luke are grounded, rooted in historical fact. I think that we're getting uh, accounts of what occurred in the life of the Holy Family uh, that go back to the principal uh, sources of uh, Joseph and Mary themselves. I explained this briefly, I think, in a little Q&A that we had after my uh, opening session. I think that there are a number of uh, rough areas where it's a little difficult to harmonize the accounts and maybe one or two places at most in my opinion where uh, a harmonization is uh, at least problematic or difficult but overall uh, I don't see any big contradictions among the account uh, between the two accounts uh, that would uh, impugn on the uh, the accuracy of the story overall as we find it in both uh, Gospels. So I'm, I'm comfortable in uh, affirming them as uh, historical accounts. Uh, I'm not bothered, of course, by the miracles that are recorded there, and I don't think the differences uh, are, stand in the way of believing them. In fact, I think the obvious differences of having two completely different narratives and yet agreeing, as I mentioned, uh, on some 18 uh, points uh, that are not, you know, obviously dependent on one another because I don't believe Matthew's copying from Luke or vice versa. That suggests that the story goes back behind or earlier than either Matthew or Luke, and therefore this is an early uh, tradition or recollection, and I would argue that comes ultimately from Joseph and Mary themselves. Uh, yeah, right. So, oh, so this one's louder than yours. Uh, so, right, I have uh, pretty much the opposite view. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I agree that there are some things that are similar uh, between Matthew and Luke's accounts, and you can, can indeed make a list. My view is that if you've got a friend who uh, tells you uh, 30 things, and 18 of them uh, you know are right, and 12 are not, then the fact that they're right about 18 of them doesn't make that a reliable person. 
So if you've got two accounts that are agree in 18 places, that, that statistic itself doesn't tell you very much if you don't know how many times they disagree. Um, my view is that when you actually read them side by side, which is what I encourage you to do, read, just read one, then read the other, uh, they are obviously very different from each other. Uh, virtually everything that Ma all of Matthew's stories are different from Luke's stories. They tell different stories, and that's not a problem, of course, because they can tell different stories. The problem is they say some things that are directly at odds with one another. Um, the genealogies cannot be reconciled. Matthew's genealogy is not Luke's genealogy. They both claim to be genealogies of Jesus, uh, of Joseph, who is allegedly Jesus' father, supposedly Jesus' father, as Luke says. Um, if Matthew is correct that the family fled to Egypt um, after the birth of Jesus, then Luke cannot be correct that they immediately went back to Nazareth. Uh, and so there, there are, and those are just two of the things. There are actually, there's a whole range of things where there are internal contradictions between them and that contradict what we know about the facts of history, especially uh, in Luke's account. Uh, there's nothing in the account that says anything about the sources of information. In other words, neither one says this is, you know, Joseph's view or, or Mary's view. And, um, the other, the final thing to say is that these were both written 50, 55, something like that, years later uh, by people who uh, had, had inherited these stories, and the stories uh, are at odds with each other at a number of really key points, and so I don't think that they are historically reliable. So when it comes to the genealogy, um, from my understanding, a lot of genealogies, they don't have to list every single person in that line and it's it's it seems obvious that matthew omits a number of names even luke does that are in the, the genealogies that we find in in the old testament so whether whoever chose whichever generation to record they may be doing that for a particular reason i don't know um, in terms of how Matthew and Luke differ, Matthew has uh, 42 generations. And when you read through these uh, a few times, you start to notice that he likes the number 14. And it's three times that he gives the number 14. And in verse 17, he sums it up and he says, so we've got 14 generations between, was it Abraham? Abraham and David, 14 between David and the deportation of Babylon and 14 between the deportation and Jesus. So something about that number 14 seems to be uh, special to Matthew. He wants to put it in these three sets of 14. And then you notice that in the third set, he uses the word, the name Jeconiah again, which was number 14 in a second set. He's reusing it in the third. He's kind of cheating there. So, and he does this to get that third set of 14. So you ask, well, what's so special about 14? And a number of scholars have said that, that uh, Matthew is using a rhetorical device here called gematria in which numerical values are assigned to letters. So. Um, if you look at the, uh, the word Dawid, it's based on three letters, a D and a V and a D. And the um, D is like the fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, so you've got four. And then the V is number six, and so you got four, six, four, 14. And so they suggest that with Gematria, Matthew has artistically put together his genealogy in order to highlight what he's communicating that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah. And if that's the case, then we want to recognize um, Matthew's uh, artistry in this and not take it so much that it has to match up with generation, generation against Luke in that sense. So that's for the uh, genealogy. And then when you come to the actual differences between after Jesus is born, yeah, it seems to me that there are some differences that are very difficult to reconcile. The primary one for me would be one that Bart mentioned earlier, and that is in Matthew, out when they're in Bethlehem, Joseph is warned by an angel to get out of there because Herod's gonna seek the child's life and they go to Egypt and they're there you know, for some time. 
whereas in Luke, it's 41 days for uh, the days of purification to happen after the birth. And then they go on the 41st day, they're there in the temple in Jerusalem, which is not far from Bethlehem, but they're there in the Jerusalem temple getting Jesus dedicated. And then after that, he goes to Nazareth. So the chronology between the two is very difficult to reconcile. What's going on? I don't know. I really don't know. Thanks. I, I should have I should have taken notes so I won't forget things. But in any case, um, I I do agree with Bart that they've inherited these traditions, and I do agree. Well, actually, I think it was probably more than fifty years. I think um, this is a long time before, so this is not. Um, it, it wouldn't be the same way I would, I would deal with some of the events where the disciples were there and, and could have retold the story and so on. Uh, at the same time, well, and I know Bart and I wouldn't agree on the, the we narratives uh, being, being, um, being actually from an eyewitness. Or, uh, but in any case, I think the, the eyewitness who traveled with Paul to Judea had plenty of time there to, I mean, he met James uh, in Acts 21. He would have had time to, to learn some of the stories. But I don't think that either Matthew or Luke knew the other one's stories. I, I think if they had known the other one, I mean, if Luke had known Matthew's account, he would have probably taken that into account and, and said, okay, well, of course, with Matthew, it's... Uh, the children from two years old and under. So this is a few years after the, uh, it could be a couple years after Jesus' birth. They're in Bethlehem for, for quite some time. I think Luke would have probably taken that into account. And, um, but it's like what you have in Acts 9.23, after many days, uh, whereas you read Paul's, Paul's letters, or you read Galatians, and you see, yeah, it was after many, many, many days. <laughs> you know, it was... Uh, up to three years, or at least a year and a half, um, that Paul spent in Nabate in Arabia before um, before going to Jerusalem. So Luke has his way of condensing the material, and that fits some of what Mike has talked about in terms of um, you know condensing things. But I think if Luke had known Matthew's story, he probably would have said, okay, well, maybe this is true, and he would have, he would have built in for that, but he doesn't. Uh, so if, hey, could I throw in just one quick afterthought? Bart just said a, a few moments ago, he remembers an event from 44 years ago. What's the big deal about 50 years? Which well, may be but too, how do you, too long. It turns out after, that I'm know. wrong about that. My memory's wrong. So the is fact... It? Yeah, look, the fact that somebody can tell you stories, that a 90-year-old person can tell you stories of things happened in the 17th century, it doesn't mean those stories are right. It just means they remember they have stories. And so, uh, so my remembrance of what I did in 1976 might be wrong. You know, I'll tell, one of the I, w I want to say something about genealogy, but one of the problems is that New Testament scholars who talk about memory generally base what they say about memory and oral tradition and eyewitnesses and how well we remember and what context we remember. They almost always say these things based on uh, what they've heard other biblical scholars say. Uh, I spent two years of my life, about five years ago, I spent two years of my life not reading anything about the New Testament or about early Christianity or about religion. I spent two years reading studies about memory. And I can tell you that most New Testament scholars who talk about memory do not know what they're talking about. Uh, I, I haven't read Craig's, Craig, I, don't, I haven't read your book, I was just looking at it. So I have, I, but um, I read psych, uh, especially uh, studies of psychology uh, studies legal texts about eyewitnesses. I read social studies about social memory. I mean, I did nothing for two years. And then I wrote a book about it, which I probably should have put memory in the title because people don't, the book is, is called Jesus Before the Gospels, where I explain what we really do know about memory and about oral tradition. Uh, and it is not what you hear all the time. Uh, and uh, so it's worth, anyway. So can I, can I just say something about something, something else, real quick. 
I just want to point out the three of us are actually agreeing that these accounts are not historically reliable. Well, it depends on how you define historically reliable. Well, if you read Luke's account, you're saying that if he had read Matthew, he would have said it differently. That's admitting that Luke is not telling you the way it happened. And so we're agreeing with that, and we're agreeing that there are reasons for that. Uh, one author might condense things. One author might have, a, have an artistic reason for doing things. One might, so there are, there are absolutely reasons. But if your question is, are they then historically reliable? No, they're not. I think that's a really Depends wooden way of looking at reliability. If you say, if you say that geneal the, geneal the genealogy of Matthew and Luke, every name is different between David and, uh, and Joseph. So they're not just leaving out a couple. They're, they are actually giving completely, so you cannot say that that genealogy, that Joseph, this was Joseph's father, then grandfather, and great-grandfather, all the way back to David, you can't say that's accurate if Luke's is different for whatever reason Matthew changed it or Luke changed it. So if, let's say Matthew is doing his genealogy for artistic purposes and his objective is not to do a yes. precise historical recounting, yes. I would say just like with the Psalms then, I wouldn't say the Psalms are historically unreliable. I might not say they're reliable historically, but I wouldn't say they're unreliable. Could we say the same thing about the genealogy of Matthew? You, you could say, yes, you could say it's an artistic thing and it's not to be taken as history. Just like the Psalms are not to be taken as history, but it's very different to say that when the psalm, psalmist says um, uh, you know, the psalmist says something about how he has sinned and he wants God to forgive him, you could say you know that's not a historical claim. But if you say Joseph's father was Jacob, that's a historical claim. Does it say his father was yes. Jacob? Yes. Jake, okay. yeah. It does actually say father rather than saying so and so begat, begat, begat. It says it's his father. <laughs> well, if, in, uh, in, I'm sorry. If, if somebody father. begot you, that's your father. If a male begot you, that, that, that's what the word father means. But they, you know, father can also mean grandfather. I mean, it, if, if son of David yeah, but can it can't mean be, But it can't be. David. The reason it can't be that, it's not that he's saying that Jacob is his great grandfather's and he's left out two generations, because every name is different. And so, like, if you had a bunch of the names that were similar and some were different, you could say, oh, they left out a generation. It is not like that. Every name is different. It's a different genealogy. And so they both can't Do you mind if I uh, uh, jump in here? Once you have one name different for whatever reason, you could have a long string of names behind both uh, uh, genealogies, and they could both be right because everybody has multiple ancestors through various lines, and the lines increase every generation these are patrilinear back. though these this it's not like that this is his father was this that person's father was that that person's so it's not like saying you know you've got two grandfathers you only have to have one that is uh, a father by virtue of something other than procreation to throw the whole assumption off kilter and there are many ways in the in ancient world as well as in the modern world where somebody can be regarded as someone's father even though he didn't physically beget him all right so if I, you, you all aren't going to want to do this but if you actually want to read a study of this that talks about and explains why that doesn't work read raymond brown's birth of the messiah he goes through these explanations and he shows so just write it down if you're really into this the birth of the messiah he's a he is raymond brown was a brilliant scholar he's absolutely absolutely a Christian and he just points out that this this kind of explanation cannot work and he shows why he especially uh, leveret marriages and all the various explanations it, they just don't work <clears throat> I, I have read Raymond Brown I'm not sure that I agree with him that it can't work but um, just another comment on uh, Matthew's adaptation Th these are minor adaptations so they they wouldn't really make the case but just you tempted me and so I have to go there uh, mm -hmm. but then I want to come back to memory um, and that, and that is, in in Matthew, you know, our translations they they kind of fudge things. They 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 want to clear up what they think are typos, uh, so that um, Ammon, that wicked king, in the genealogy, it really doesn't say Ammon in Matthew. It says Amos, who was a prophet. And Asa, there's a, a letter added in Greek. Uh, it becomes Asaph. So he, he weaves the Psalms and the prophets into the background uh, of, of the genealogy uh, in, a, in, a, 
you know, it's a small midrashic change, just adding a letter, or, uh, changing a letter. But in any case, it's orthographic. But um, <clears throat> regarding memory, uh, I, I read, uh, of course, I read your book, and I read uh, Daniel Schachter and a number of the sources that you cited, Barry Schwartz, and so on. But I actually think that while while they do point out the errors of memory, both social memory, in the case of Barry Schwartz, psychological memory, in the case of Daniel Schachter, there's uh, both those sources and a lot of others also point out the uh, continuance of memory and uh, substantial continuance of memory. So, <clears throat> yeah, people make people make mistakes, but I think there's actually a lot a lot more that can be argued for. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with that, and I, I I think of course we remember things correctly. So I'm not you know I'm not saying we never you know of course most of the things we remember uh, are correct. Um, so how do you know if two sources are correctly remembering? Uh, well, you compare them to each other and you see if they're consistent. If they are inconsistent, then somebody's not remembering correctly, or they're both not remembering correctly. Yeah. All right, we should get to some of the uh, questions from our live audience here. But uh, like I said, I hope you brought your sunglasses. Uh, we've seen some great engagement here uh, between the different views. Uh, and so we've had uh, some great questions come in. Uh, this question comes from 4523. Uh, if we can only judge Gospels as ancient, uh, or rather by ancient biographical standards, and those standards are so low in regards to historical reliability, <coughs> have we lowered the idea of reliability too low? So maybe we'll, Mike and Craig, you could take that I, first. I don't know if I'd consider them low. I'd consider them maybe closer to ordinary human discourse, which, you know, I think when we... Sometimes we're holding them to standards that we wouldn't hold one another to in ordinary conversation. Or, or contemporary biography, maybe even. He, well, contemporary, contemporary academic biography, you know, you have to document everything and, and so on. Contemporary popular biography, I think you've got a lot of um, conflation and things like that that can go on. I, and I would, maybe a parallel could be like translations, English translations. So take the New American Standard Bible and the English Standard Version. They're more like, uh, what do you call them, functional equivalent or literal translations. And then take the message, okay, which is a paraphrase. Um, it, should you judge the accuracy of a paraphrase according to the rules of a literal translation? That seems to me to be... Um, ill-conceived to do that. So you would do the paraphrase according to, is, is it retaining the gist? Is it retaining the meaning of what's going on? But if you're judging it by the literal standards, that you, that's the wrong approach. I, I'm completely agreeing with what both of these uh, guys are saying, but I'm not sure that you all are understanding the significance of it. Because if you say that you're judging them by ancient standards, suppose you say that, okay, instead of saying we're going to judge the Gospel of John according to the standard of somebody who writes a, a biography of George Washington, you can't do that because these are ancient biographies, they don't do it that way. I completely agree with that. So if you apply that and say, okay, we're going to uh, see how they stack up against, say, uh, Arian's biography of Alexander the Great. Okay, or if you say, we're going to do it by a uh, basis of Plutarch's biography of X. I mean, just, just pick, yes, that, that is exactly right. That's what you need to do. And scholars of Alexander the Great and scholars of Plutarch agree these are not historically accurate by our standards. False. And so, what, really? Do you, want to get, do you want to get John Ramsey in on this? Yeah. <laughs> Christopher Pelling, leading Plutarch scholar in the world. All he right. wouldn't say but, it's unreliable, but he'd say it's true enough. That's the term he okay. uses. Okay, so does he, does he think that Plutarch's life of Romulus is historically accurate? 
No. And he says that very clearly in his life of thesis, exactly. chapter one. But that's because it's happening uh, so far back, 800, 1,000 years before, where he says it's the land of poets and fabulists. And so he's going to reconstruct these to give them a semblance of history. However, when he comes to things like the life of Cicero, Caesar, Pompey, Cato, Eutychensis, then he says, yep, that's, that's history yes. there. The other, the other problem, of course, is that Plutarch was in the upper, upper one, you know, point zero zero one percent of intellectuals in his world. Mark was not. That, that seems to me to be a little bit um, elitist of a perspective. No, it is elitist. These people were elitist. Plutarch was a complete elitist. Oh, he was. Yes. But you've got, you've got so many cases of, of oral memory on a popular level where people can remember. Okay, let's talk about oral memory then. Yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, there have been numerous studies of oral memory that have been done, and none of them by modern anthropologists indicate that oral memory is accurate the way you're describing it. By verbatim standards. But in terms of substance, actually many not of them always. do argue that. No, not always. Even if you take your example of, uh, even if you take your Ken Bailey example, I mean, he is just flat out wrong about so many things he's, and it's been proven that he was wrong. It has nothing actually, to do with whether he lived there for um, 18 years or not. We Whedon's critique that supposedly proved that I've actually taken Whedon's critique to task on, on some points, but... Well, no, there are things to take task on, but his basic point, I mean... But there's some things there he gets wrong, yes. There are data that are just, I mean, just flat out wrong. There's some things he gets wrong. Within, within a lifetime. So the idea that like within 50 years we have a good oral accurate. memory. No, I'm sorry. You know, it doesn't take long for somebody to get information wrong about someone that passes along an oral tradition. All of us have had stories told about us. There, I mean, there are people, our friends have written things about me in books that are just wrong. Yeah. And it's not like 50 years later. He could have called me and I would have told him it's wrong. Yeah. But, but we also have with oral tradition, often you have the, the basic substance of the events that are condensed and passed on accurately. And this is Walter Ong. This is, this is major authors, major scholars in okay, the field think, of oral uh, tradition, oh, which no, I go tradition. through and document in my, in my book. Okay, so anthropologists have studied, for example, speeches uh, that are given. So you mentioned these people who memorize long lists of things. Not verbatim. No, not verbatim. And, and they'll say it's the same thing. So we've had anthropologists who go in the field uh, in, say, Yugoslavia, where people can memorize things as long as the Iliad and the Odyssey. Turns out they don't actually memorize these things, right. point one. They do not memorize not these verbatim. things. No, they don't memorize them. But the They're basic composing substance them. of it, they do get right each and time they change it. No, they do it right means what? The, 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 the anthropologist Substance, will record not the verbatim. that one person will sing a poem, uh, and then five years later, I'll go back, the guy will sing the same poem, and he'll say, it is the same. And one of the versions will be 1,000 lines long, and the other will be 3,000 lines long. Yeah. Does that sound like the same? But the substance of the story stays the same. The same anthropologists say the it's substance. It's a story about a guy whose daughter got same. married and she got, got happily married and then her, her husband died. Yes, so maybe that's we all actually, the same. Maybe we actually agree on the gist. The, depends what you call yeah. gist. Yeah. There was a Jesus. Oh. He, he, did, <clears throat> he, did, he was a Jewish teacher. <clears throat> he did come from Galilee. He did get crucified. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, the gist is right. Yeah. But, but what counts as the <clears throat> gist? Is walking on water part of the gist? Uh, well, it's, a, it's certainly the gist of that particular episode. There are all sorts of episodes that Christians made up about Jesus. Uh, I'm not sure really? we agree on that. Do you think when Jesus was a 12-year-old, he really zapped his teacher? Now, we're talking about that's something that's beyond living memory. I'm talking about things that were within the case of living memory. I'm talking about the first century Gospels. Okay, so you think everything, every story in the Gospels actually happened? Yeah. Okay, I don't. But, uh, but oral memory is not going to help you on that. I'd like, because, to, yeah, okay, sorry, I'd like to get Rob in on this. Yeah. I'm curious um, what, what your thoughts are. I'm just surviving over <laughs> here. I'm fine. <laughs> I feel like I need to have 20 years of education, you know, just to keep up with these guys. Oh, by the way, though, can I, the, the question that was initially, can, can I just say about one more the, thing about that? View, and then we'll come yes. back. To, uh -huh. uh, no, just um, like, for example, when in Acts chapter 2, 
You have Peter quoting from Joel, in the last days, says God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Joel doesn't say in the last days, he says afterwards. But, you know, taken from the context, you can say, okay, in the last days. And, and Peter adds in line, and they shall prophesy. That's not there in Joel. Is that a mistake, or is that the kind of license that they were allowed to take, and that it was assumed that they were allowed to take? Or when uh, Luke retells the same story in different places and, and tell, it tells it in different wording, I mean, is he, is he stupid, or does he assume that his audience is going to assume that he has those liberties? I think we, we can see from the text itself. I agree. They have liberties. They have lots of liberties. Uh, so, Rob, so your thoughts here on this, um, uh, perhaps a low concept of reliability, does that not drive with uh, your take on uh, how trustworthy the Gospels are? Well, as I mentioned in... Is, are you hearing me okay? Okay, because I can barely hear myself. Uh, uh, it, my, no, it's, I'm okay. So, as I said in my uh, breakout uh, yesterday, it's, I think, hazardous to draw broad generalizations about all ancient Greco-Roman biographies and then impose these uh, generalizations on the Gospels, either in, uh, in order to uh, uphold their historical accuracy or in order to impugn it, because uh, ancient biographies differed in quality among, the, among themselves, uh, one from one from another, and the, we're talking about a wide array of texts that simply have enough family resemblances that scholars like to kind of uh, classify them together and, and call them uh, bi Greco-Roman biographies, but that doesn't mean that you can take a generalization about the family and apply it to a specific individual text, just like you can't take the average height of people in a room and say, therefore, you know, Kurt Jaros is, you know, six foot two. I uh, wish. You know, uh, or Rob Bowman. It, 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 you can't reason that way. So, uh, and I would say, say the same thing, and I'm going to say this as, in terms of this particular field of research, as an amateur. So I'm just going to acknowledge that right up front. In terms of oral studies, oral memory, and, and the study of oral memories, you can't generalize from a lot of different studies about how oral memory generally works or what the averages are or what we often find and in many cases they don't remember things the same way or they tell it differently or they tell it amazingly the same. You can't take any of that kind of stuff and then say therefore the Gospels did it this way, therefore they did remember it accurately or they didn't because the Gospels are their own thing. We have to look at what the circumstances were that led to the, or, to the writing of the Gospels uh, if you believe, as I do, that they are at least based on eyewitness testimony from people who were still alive uh, that when the writers uh, at least started work on their books, if you th and in the case of a couple of them, I think they were largely written by eyewitnesses, uh, you don't have to worry about this oral memory tradition thing for 50 years, you know, being passed down to several different generations of, of uh, uh you know, rhetoricians or storytellers. Uh, it's coming, very, there's a very short uh, gap to get from the uh, eyewitness to the text. Uh, if you don't accept that, if you think there was a period of a half a century of uh, people playing telephone or something, uh, then you're going to have a very different view uh, of how reliable the memory is. So I just think we should be careful about generalizing from a mass of studies in, in a particular field like this, whether it's uh, biographies, whether it's oral memory and so forth, uh, tradition, uh, to what is specifically going on in the Gospels. Can I just say, I completely agree with that, and uh, I, think it, I think that that's right. And the only, reason, the only reason I deal with oral tradition is because the traditional line is that oral tradition was reliable back then, and my view is that uh, we don't know that, and in fact, we have reasons not to think that. If you do think they're written by eyewitnesses, though, then you need to look into how valid is eyewitness testimony. You can't, you can't just assume that if somebody's an eyewitness, they're going to be telling it the way it really happened. But that, and there's that, a massive documentation on that. That's where multiple independent sources come, come in handy. Right. And look, look, you and I might disagree on how we're going to look at and define historically reliable. I, I understand that. And I think it's kind of the difference between the guy versus the girl version of the story. And this is something Sexist. on which reasonable people can disagree. Um, what I would say, though, is 
if we're going to say that the Gospels are not historically reliable or they're historically unreliable because of these kind of differences, then of course we have to say that that's going to apply to all ancient literature, yes. with the exception of perhaps Esconius, who my friend John Ramsey is researching right now. <laughs> but if we say that all ancient, li so you'd say all ancient literature is historically unreliable. Well, no, no, I, I just mean you can't accept that it's reliable until you evaluate it. And you evaluate it by certain historical criteria that you use, you use the same criteria for Plutarch that you use for John. Right, but, but all of these guys take these kind of liberties that we're talking That's about. That's right. So if they're going to be historically unreliable, then if you're, I mean, you can have that definition again, reasonable people can disagree on this. Um, but if we're going to apply that to all ancient literature, then I think that can give a false impression by saying it's all historically unreliable because it gives the impression that we can know very little about the past. And of course, that is a wrong impression. Okay, but just a second. So you, you had a leap of logic there. First of all, I'm not saying it's all unreliable. I'm saying you, ju you judge each case individually. But suppose you could show that all ancient sources are unreliable. You can't say that's not true because then we wouldn't know about the past. Well, it, that would be the conclusion you draw. You can't know about the but that that is not why they have to be reliable. In other words, you can't say they have to be reliable, otherwise we wouldn't know. Mike is saying, though, is that they all take these same kind of liberties. I agree they all take the same. We are completely on the same page with that. And I'm saying that that means that it, it doesn't make the Gospels reliable simply because they take the same liberties everybody else takes. R right, I, I agree. So, but what I'm saying is if we're going to say the Gospels are historically unreliable because Matthew says the centurion himself went to Jesus rather than the emissaries and all the other ancient literatures are applying these same sort of compositional devices, therefore they would be unreliable, That's that gives the person who is not up on historical matters, which is most, uh, that gives the, the false impression that we can know very little about the past. And I'm just saying, well, all I'm saying, Bart, is that, well, I'm just making that observation. It, it that's, is absolutely that's right. It's absolutely it, right. Is, is there maybe a difference here between methodological approach? Should we um, uh, approach the texts or ancient documents with a more skeptical eye to begin with, a neutral eye to begin with, or a positive, guilty, uh, innocent until proven guilty approach? No, historians always take a skeptical approach. That's what historians do. Theologians may not no. do it, but no, it is. No, His it isn't. Mike, I'm sorry. I think I found the difference. I teach in a, I teach in a research university, yep. which has a very large history department. And I can tell you, the approach to history is to question your sources. Uh, you can question them, but that doesn't mean you take a skeptical approach from the beginning to, well, okay. You don't assume that they're unreliable. No, you, you do take, not assume okay. they're unreliable. All right, okay. As long as we come with an open approach and say, a neutral approach to say they may or may not be reliable, let's check them out, I'm with even, you. Even check them they, out. Even there, if they use those methods that we talked about. Yeah, no, uh, you check them out, you use methods. I'd like to suggest that there's a little bit of fuzziness in the discourse about reliability. Right. And the reason why I would say that is because reliability is not the same thing as accuracy. If I say that a particular passage is accurate, that's different from saying that the book in which it is found is reliable. Reliability means that you have reached the judgment that this particular text or source of information can be counted on to give you valid information. So that you're not having to verify, corroborate, or confirm every single detail in order to continue using the text as a source of helpful information. It might be uh, more helpful or illuminating if we were to say, uh, are the Gospels informative, historically informative, uh, and, and avoid the term reliability altogether, because uh, to say that they're historically informative simply means that we can go to them and, and find information about the past. To say that they're reliable and then turn that into a kind of a, uh, you know, yes or no, uh, black or white, uh, you know, switch on or switch off uh, judgment uh, forces a kind of uh, uh, either or thinking on 
uh, that whole pro that whole question that I think is is uh, not helpful because then we get polarized into our camps. I say it's historically reliable. Bart says it isn't. I think both of us agree that the Gospels are historically informative. We may disagree about how informative they are, but we both agree that there is information that can be learned from the Gospels about the historical Jesus. I, I agree. Everybody, I think, here would agree with that. Everybody except for the mythicists would probably agree with that. Mm -hmm. And so my, when I say reliable, I don't mean a kind of a blanket statement. I really mean if, uh, if the Gospel of Matthew says that Jesus gave this speech and this is what he said, is it true that he did it? And these are the words he said. Is it, is, that's what I mean by reliable. Did he really do that or not? And I think we have to evaluate it rather than simply assume that, yes, he did. In fact, I think there are reasons for thinking he did not. So. Gentlemen, at this time, I'd like you to ask that you turn off your microphones and place them down so that you can hold this dry erase board. Four of them, one for each. Going to play a little trivia game, see how knowledgeable these guys are after all. Okay, uh, this is kind of like the dating game, yes. And, uh, well, let, let's, start, let's start with not a trivia question. Let's get you used to writing on the board, okay? Um, so, yes, there you go, and then the eraser is the uh, cover, yep, so you, good. Okay, uh, we've had some questions come in about the doctrine of inerrancy. And so, uh, this is a yes or no question, so I hope you can write out your answer. Uh, <laughs> And I know there will be different definitions, so we'll go through and explain then. So if you could, for the audience, um, yes or no, do you hold to the doctrine of inerrancy? <laughs> uh, and okay, are we all... Uh, um, <laughs> okay. okay, three. Two, one. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, here Rob says yes. Uh, uh, we have, uh, Bart says yes. No, sorry, I forgot no. Mike says yes, and Craig says, Sulege, you say that I do. Uh, okay, so now let's go and, and maybe uh, have each of you describe what you mean, just briefly. So uh, Rob, you said yes. Sorry. When I affirm that the Bible is inerrant, I am saying that uh, what the Bible teaches and, and affirms, what it, it con intends to convey, is truth. Uh, and it can do that in a variety of genres, in a variety of ways, according to a variety of conventions. But uh, when we uh, determine what the text actually uh, said that uh, the biblical writers produced, and uh, we've understood it correctly, what it is uh, presenting to us, what is it intending to convey to us, would be truth. My view is that the word inerrant means having no errors. And so if the Bible has errors, it's not inerrant. Uh, and I, I differentiate between inerrancy and truthfulness. Um, that something um, uh, that that we're not really asking, do you believe in the theological truths of the Bible? If if the Bible says that uh, Jesus walked on water, and he didn't really walk on water, it's trying to affirm that, and it's wrong. So it might contain a kind of religious truth or a spiritual truth, but it's it's not inerrant. No, it could be wrong in all sorts of ways. I mean, it could be it could be wrong, but I'm I'm just I mean I'm talking about hi history now, but th we're just kind of scratching the surface. I mean, I'm just talking about history, but we could talk about philosophical truth, theological truth, religious truth, all sorts of truth. Yeah. I would define inerrancy as saying the Bible is true, trustworthy, and without error in all that it teaches. I would also say that this applies not only to the autographs, but to our present Bible. I am not concerned on whether there are some errors in some peripheral insignificant details. That doesn't bother me if, if there are. So I'm not saying that there are any, I'm not saying that they're not. I'm saying 
I don't know, I don't really care. I'm just saying that the Bible is without error in all that it teaches, autographs and present Bible. Just concisely, I agree with Mike and with Rob. Okay, now we've got, uh, oh yeah, yeah, in that part, yeah. All right, some trivia questions now. Okay, here's the first trivia question. How did Judas Iscariot die? Take a moment. Tell me your answer. All right, take a moment. Bum, 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 bum. Bum 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 ba da 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 dum bum bum ba da dum bum 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 ba dum bum 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 How'd I do? All right. Craig's finishing up here. The question is how did Judas Iscariot die? You, you, may, you may get a chance to explain, Craig. You may get a chance. Yes. Oh, man. The guy who wrote the commentary on Acts. Yeah. Okay. He's finishing up. And I hope he is because he's at the end of his board. Okay. Turn the boards over in three, two, one. Uh, Rob says slowly. <laughs> Bart says, depends which account you read. Uh, Mike says, hanging, and that's his guess. Uh, Craig says, possible harmonization. If it is harmonized, the rope broke or was cut after he died, and his guts splattered. Okay. Okay, well, first let me give a little context. So there are, uh, yes, there are, it depends which account you read, yes. Uh, so there are two possible ways. Uh, uh, the scriptures seem to say that Judas died. One is that he uh, hung himself on a tree, um, and then the other is that he threw himself down a hill. No. Fell down a hill. No. Okay. Well, see, I'm not the New Testament scholar here. So uh, we will let these gentlemen uh, explain. Papias. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to have to pass the microphone along again. Let's keep these answers brief. We'll, we'll start this end. Okay. Your, your answer for Judas Iscariot. Oh, just which account you read, but I do think there is a way, if you harmonize them, there is a way that they can be harmonized. I mean, if they cut the rope, which would be the simplest way, better, and it's not. But Papias says he was swollen, swollen, he couldn't get through a door, and he. he you learn something new every day. Uh, well, the Papias account comes from I, oh, someone of Laodicea, I think it was, but it's fourth century. And so we, we, I think it'd be fair to ask, did Papias really say that? Um, because that is a kind of a weird story. So um, I, I probably tend to think that, that Judas hanged himself. And Luke's account where it says uh, that he fell headlong and his guts first open. Um, I looked up that um, term about falling headlong, and I found that when you look at the Septuagint, New Testament, elsewhere, it is kind of a figure of speech equivalent to what we might say today, his career took a dive when. Um, and so that could have something like that. I'm not trying to do something really stretch and be, I, I'm open to a real contradiction here. But I do think that it's possible, I'm, I'm seriously possible, that Luke is using some sort of a figure of speech there and that there isn't actually a contradiction. Uh, on Papias, you know, the thing about Papias is that people like to quote him when it supports views that they like. 
such as that uh, Peter, uh, you know, that Mark was Peter's secretary and wrote down what Peter told him, and that, you know, so you get, and Matthew wrote down the gospel in Hebrew. They, they like these passages because it confirms their views, but then the passages that don't confirm their views, they say, you know, they don't, they don't trust Papias, but the Papias quotations all come to us from later sources. They don't, some of them, they all come from later sources. So, uh, yeah, so um, Matthew says he hanged himself. Uh, the book of Acts says that he fell headlong and he burst his guts over the field and it's not the the contradiction is not just that it's also who bought the field uh, and what happened to the money so there there are a number of contradictions in these accounts it doesn't i don't think it works to say that it could be reconciled by saying that somebody cut the rope or that the rope broke because he fell headlong if somebody's hanging by the neck and the rope's cut they f they fall feet first and it doesn't, I don't think it works. It's an interesting idea, Mike, you've got that it's a symbolic statement. And the, word, the word can be used metaphorically, but usually it's, used not meta, it's not used metaphorically when it's giving a kind of a, a, a physical description of something that happened. You see what I mean? And this is a physical description of something that happened. So I don't think, it, I think it means that he fell headlong. My uh, facetious uh, response that he died slowly uh, was meant as a, tongue-in-cheek way of saying that I think this may be one of those places where we simply don't have enough information to give a confident answer as to how we should uh, correlate these two passages. The traditional or at least very common uh, harmonization that Craig mentioned I think is possible but I don't think we can argue strongly for it. Uh, I think it's just a, a possible explanation. I think Craig was going to comment that if he had to choose, uh, he might think that Matthew was being a little bit more artistic in his uh, description than, than Luke. I can't see any reason why Luke would make up these details for some kind of theological purpose. Uh, so it, it, maybe Matthew might have, but uh, in any case, I think that we're going to run into this in some places in the New Testament where we have accounts that we just don't have enough information to be sure or to be confident in a particular resolution? Uh, quickly, quickly. So in, in terms of your, in response to your statement about, you know, we're being selected and what we trust Papias for, the guy who quotes Papias on that Judas thing, we don't know much about him, and so it's hard to say whether he's reliable. But Eusebius is quoting him um, on the other stuff in terms of Matthew and, and Mark, where Mark's getting his... It's actual text. Yeah. Quote, yeah, uh, quoting the actual text there. And it's not just that testimony, it's the testimony from others, and there's other reasons to think that Mark is getting his source, let's say, from Peter. Um, the, the evidence we have for the authorship of Mark is superior to what we have for Plutarch's lives, and yet no one questions whether Plutarch wrote the lives. They question some of the moralia, but none of the lives, and yet our best source for the lives is the Lamprius catalog, which is a minimum of 100 years after Plutarch's death, and maybe be more than 200 years, and it's falsely attributed to his son. Um, but nobody questions whether Plutarch wrote the lives. And I, again, I'd say despite the problem with this one source in the third or fourth century reporting this weird story about the death of Judas, I don't see really much problem with, with what Papias is saying. How about the other sayings of Papias? Uh, which ones? Any of them. About the, the, the glories of the kingdom. Jesus allegedly said that in the kingdom of God, every, uh, every vine will have, uh, so there'll be, a, every vine will have a thousand uh, boughs, and every bough will have a thousand branches, and every branch will have a thousand twigs, and every, uh, and every twig will have a thousand sprigs, and every sprig will have a thousand clusters, and every cluster will have a thousand grapes, and each grape will yield 25 to 30 gallons of wine. So, I mean, really, <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the comments people want to trust on Papias are the ones that they agree with. The ones they don't agree with, they say, well, you can't really trust those. That one sounds to me, though, I mean, well, actually, later church fathers thought he was, uh, something was wrong with his brain. But, including his yeah, yeah, and part of, it, part of it was the different millennial views, too. Right. But, but having said that, I mean, it looks to me like the, the, the example that you gave sounds to me like 
fairly good apocalyptic kind of language like you might have from a Palestinian Jewish sage. You think Jesus said that? All right, we're running low on time. Last trivia question here. Uh, this stems from, ooh, good save by me. Okay, we have two conflicting, seemingly conflicting passages. Mark 6, 8 says, these were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Luke 9, 3, as it reloads, says to take nothing, not even a staff. Okay, it's the equivalent parallel account, reading horizontally. So the trivia question is this. Did, this, did the disciples take a staff? <laughs> like Mr. Bean, you know? Three, two, one, and turn. A question mark. Half of them did. Yes, probably yes. Okay, let's go through quick explanations. Under 60 seconds. I, I really don't know, but I, I do would lean towards saying, yes, they took a staff. Told them not to, so they probably didn't. Matthew and Luke say not to take one. Mark says to take one. I think he, if we'd been there, Jesus said, take one. But either Matthew, Luke, or the source from which they drew changed it in order to make the point more clearly that they were to rely on God for everything. The point, I think, is there with Mark, but Matthew, Luke, or their source want to make it all the more clearer. So they simplify. Do you think they're reliable when they change it? Yeah. They, cause, so because said, they're communicating said, the gist accurately. So he said, take it. Yep. And That's correct. And they're accurate in yes. the report. Yes, in the gist of, of what they're reporting. Absolutely. Okay. I, I think probably I, I would agree with Mike on that. Uh, in terms of the, the, the main point there, um, I, should, I, I do want to qualify something from earlier uh, where Bart asked me if I believe you know, the events in the Gospels, um, that I'm not saying that my historical methodology takes me that far. Uh, and like Rob was saying, you know, Gospels are different, oral tradition's different, it doesn't guarantee those things. So I go, you know, beyond the, the evidence that I have on faith, but, you know, the evidence I have, I think, points towards reliability, but he asked me what I believed, and so I said what I believe is personally. Gentlemen, same time next week. <laughs> this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much uh, for participating in the panel discussion. <laughs> well, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, what a way to close out the conference. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, that does it for the program today. I'm grateful for the continued support of our patrons. Those are folks that just chip in a few bucks each month. And the partnerships that we have with our sponsors. They are Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, the Illinois Family Institute, and Fox Restoration. I want to thank our technical producer, Chris, for all the fine work that he does live streaming. Great job, Chris. And to our guests today, Craig Keener, Mike Lacona, Bart Ehrman, and Rob Bowman, give them one more round of applause. And last but certainly not least, I want to thank you, the listener and viewer, for joining us here for another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. We'll see you next week. <laughs>